dream come true. It's the biggest cliche that we use in football, but it was though. at the back and you want to get through then get through you the previous the season Argyle reached the League Cup semi-finals and much of the high expectation was due to a lad signed in 1973 from non-league Chorley a big thing about Paul Mariner is he's recommended by a scout called Verdi Godwin up in the uh, north and um, suggested that uh, initially Tony Waiters wasn't too impressed and wasn't going to sign him and um, the story is that Verdi Goblin said, if you don't sign this guy, then um, I'm wasting my time scouting for you. So, you know, I might as well pack up and, uh, you know, you either sign him or I pack up. Tony Waiters used to have this committee thing. He'd have these, because he had a big staff then, he'd have a chief coach, Alan Brown and who, um, other people. And he tried to say, well, what do you think? And what do you think? And so on. And the opinion was just by one vote to sign him on. So they signed him on. It was a fluke, really. I signed on his 22nd birthday. It was quite ironic. I, yeah. I, yeah, I finished um, my engineering apprenticeship on the 22nd of May, uh, when I was 20, and I, I signed in London uh, on the same day. We suddenly saw that this guy had signed. He looked more like a rock star than a footballer, which was, you know, fantastic at the time, of course. But I think the best thing, the thing that always stuck in my mind, was the quote that he gave the newspapers, which was, and I quote, I would have walked to Plymouth to have signed for the football club and for Tony Waiters. And what I can never understand is why such a good player wasn't picked up by Manchester United or Manchester City, all those big football league clubs all, all around the Lancashire area. They must have seen him. They got scouts all over the place, haven't they? I just can't understand why they didn't pick him up. While Mariner may have walked to Plymouth, his new striking partner was chauffeur-driven by the manager. Then he came and picked us up at Michaelwood Services because I think he was thinking if, if we had to travel the whole way because at that time you had to go through Bristol and um, it did seem as though it was forever, you know. Early performances were dismal though, including a first round exit from the League Cup. The away record was poor. Argyle were only just above the relegation zone after two months of the campaign. Uh, well, the way the season started, I think they lost about the first seven away matches on the trot, including a fairly heavy defeat up at Wrexham. They were winning most of their home games. Obviously, with um, those away defeats, there were certainly no indications that we were on a promotion run. And um, I do remember writing a fairly critical piece um, at uh, one stage, and the alarm bells were ringing was the... Uh, the type of the headline that we had because you know they just did not seem as if they were going to be mounting a promotion challenge. Pre-season games everything went well and uh, uh, that, you know we really thought that um, we were going to get off to a flyer and I remember in the early games first five six seven games um, although we were playing quite well we were scoring goals but we were having a few problems defensively and we were conceding too many goals and consequently we were down towards the bottom of the division. We knew we were going to get it right. The the, the way that Tony went about his business with the, tr with the coaching staff, um, we knew that we were on the right track and we just weren't, weren't clicking. We knew that we would click eventually. That click was soon heard in a midweek home win over Huddersfield, followed by a Saturday visit from Walsall. And a very strong wind. Cleared by Sloan to Dell. Now with Burrows, tries a chip, oh and that's well cleared. Peter Dark with a throw and you can guarantee this will be a long one. Mariners on the line. Got it back, Hardcastle's there and Rafferty, he can't get it in, can he get a shot? No! Dell. oh just wide to the left. Good effort by John Dell. Harry Burrows with the free kick. Trying to Rafferty, that's a good header, hits the bar! Oh, Argyle is suffering at the moment. Back to Burrows. Gets it in again, Mariner flips back. There's a chance for Burrows. Gets a deflection on the way in, with Randall, has a shot, oh, well saved again. And into the middle, it's Thunder Rafferty, can he turn? He does! Oh, it's a great goal! Oh, 
A beautiful goal by Bill Rafferty. Across from the right from Colin Randall. Rafferty had it on his wrong foot. Managed to turn and put it in. It is Sloan. Must have a shot. Comes to Buckley. If he can turn. Oh, that's a goal! A goal by George Andrews. Just a minute after Argyle take the lead, it's now 1-1. One, one. Now out to Burrows, if he can get round. Harrison, he's got a chance. Into Green, go over the shot. It's a good shot, that's the goal! But then the arrival from Liverpool of Hugh McCauley completed this 11 and the click became a loud bang. Brian Johnson on the right provided the balance, Randall and Dell were the heartbeat, and the defence oozed experience. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that um, the arrival of Huey, when he came with his pairs, he was very quick. Uh, he played up at Liverpool, so he'd been around the big time, uh, you know, a little bit, and uh, so the, you know, nothing sort of fostered him. He's a real bright, bubbly lad. And the one thing that we knew, uh, you know, the front players and attacking midfield players were that, that, that Huey would definitely get them in for you. So if we were going to make our runs and get into the spaces, then we knew that he'd come. You know, you had your blue collar guys, you had your skilled guys, you had people that could open the door for you with a pass, and you know, you had somebody that could put the foot in, yeah. you know, and stamp their authority on the game when things weren't going particularly well to give the so-called skilled lads a bit more room. By the visit of Bournemouth, an unbeaten run had extended to six league games, but the toll was already telling on a small squad. It was tough sometimes because um, quite often, you know, you'd be pushed out onto the pitch when you weren't um, fully fit. You know, sometimes you'd be 80% fit. In fact, I uh, can remember having a hamstring injury. Uh, I think it, it was the match against, uh, we played Bournemouth at home. Corner to Argyle, taken by Young McCauley. And that wasn't a bad corner at all, punched away by Charlton. That went on for probably two or three months of the season, but people wouldn't be aware of it. But um, because, uh, you know, because of the situation, you didn't have the rotation system that you have today, and uh, you didn't, you know, managers didn't have the luxury of being able to Put, you know, you maybe had one or two strikers, but I think the way things were and the re reputation that Paul and I had, probably Tony Waiters thought just that my, or if Paul was injured, just our presence of being on the pitch was probably better than having somebody else in. And so it proved against Bournemouth. Billy was still quick enough and eventually too quick for exactly. the camera. Rafferty. That's a beautiful chip in. And Johnson Brown. Oh, what a beautiful shot and what a beautiful save. Johnson Rafferty over the far side and Delve in the middle. And that's a good ball from Delve. Mariner to McCauley. Back to Delve. They're working well, Argyle now. And Johnson is in there with his head, but it's cleared. It's Randall. Rafferty's there, he's got a chance, that's a beautiful shot! Charlton was beaten. There's his shot. Oh, beautifully saved! Shot from Mariner. Kevin Charlton has kept Bournemouth in this game, that's two superb saves. The corner quickly taken. Burrows into the middle. Johnson's shot, it's cleared. Randall out to Hoare. This could be dangerous. Oh, well saved again by Charlton. took that so well. <laughs> uh, 
a rare born the corner dangerous and Fennell did very well to keep that out now corner on the other side this is Trevor Howard ball coming out oh and a shot by Alan Welsh formerly of course with Argyle Payne with the free kick, that's a better one, cleared by Green, Greenhall is there but uh, can't get the shot in. No one upfield for Argyle. That's in fact a very good ball to Neil Haig on the far side, he tries a shot and well saved indeed by Fennell. That ball was swirling in the wind. He's rapidly going through, he's got round them and he's got to have a shot, oh so close. And Billy was often on his knees in training. It was a hard school. Now the picture may get a bit clouded as we go along. Fitness freak. 30, two times 15. Um, Keep your head up, Bob. Work from there. Have to point my toes now, I think. <laughs> we used to train too hard, really. Um, not, not only at Plymouth, but uh, you know, all through my career. Uh, I can remember for the last three years of my career, I, I played in Portugal, and uh, we didn't do half of the training that we did. But in match, you still felt every bit as fit. Long runs, pre-season was, or the yardage we used to do uh, up and down the hills, around Central Park, um, and the gaffer would be in front with his shirt off and leading the pack, and Alan Brown sort of barking at the back. We just did everything they wanted us to do, yeah. and more. Former lifeguard waiters had another hard man assisting him. You know, Alan's had us climbing up telegraph poles in the snow on the on the um, shale field at the back of the back of home park. He had us picking up stones on Dartmoor. He had us doing all sorts of crazy things. But you know, it's a bonded experience. And at the time, you think, what the hell are we doing that for? But there's method in the training methods of many people. Alan. No well, I'll be long remembered um, with the squad for a shadow play, and um, we played we played at morning, noon, and night sometimes. Um, but the good thing about it was, although at times and towards the end of a long period you get a little bit bored with it, but we were drilled. We knew exactly uh, what we were going to do on Saturday, and we knew what our mates was going to do in situations um, because we played it so much and. Alan was a, a stickler for it, and it had to be, at, you know, at you know match pace. We used to be safe. We used to come back in the afternoons, and wow. it'd be dark sometimes going home. <laughs> but we were drilled. <laughs> As I get older now, you you know what it takes to become a very good team. It's a lot of training, and the things that that sometimes you think, you know, how does that player get the ball in so much time and space? Is because they've been reading it three and four past ahead because it's something that, that you do over and over and over again in the training ground. Getting to know uh, Randall and Delvey in the midfield, getting to know Yui what he'd do when he was dipping his shoulder, coming inside, whipping it in. Out. So you, you would time your runs off, you know, people's bodies really. That well-drilled machine then faced former Argyle manager Malcolm Allison. He predicted a 4-0 cup win for his big city slickers who had two future England managers in their side. It's Peter Taylor coming away, handball which the referee allowed to go on. Ball with Henshelwood. Cross to Cannon on the far side now with Whittle. He could have a shot from there. He can't get a shot in, but now he can. Not a bad shot, just to the left. Ball with Paul Johnson. Gets across into Randall. This is with Rafferty. Oh! Rafferty upended by Ian Evans. Mulligan with a free kick. It wasn't a bad one. If Whittle can get there, but he can't. Ian Taylor, Peter Taylor puts the ball eventually into the middle. Cleared by Green, to Rafferty, to Mariner, but Venables gets it, now with Whittle, cleared by Hoare, free kick to Palace, that's it!
is McCauley who's over on the the other wing to Dell to Johnny Hall Rafferty is at the far post and that won't be far away from him it's clear to Dell oh Well, Delver scored one like that this year, and that wasn't so far away. So, after ten minutes of the second half, a beautiful free kick taken by Randall. That was a very good kick indeed by Randall, and Burns was only just able to keep it out. Hall into the middle, Rafferty and Banner is there. It's cleared to Hall. Oh, the deflection of Swindlehurst. Now the game's lining up. Corner taken by McCauley. Saxton crowd, that could be a goal! And there's trouble in the goal mark. Well, the game has been boiling up. We've had an injury to Dell and to Johnson in the last couple of minutes. Saxton went in very hard on the keeper there, but it looked fair. Corner taken by McCauley. Argyle 1-0 down now. 20 minutes to go. It's come to Green. That's hard. Well, Mike Green has scored some good goals this year, but perhaps none as valuable as that one. Rogers, the ball with Hugh McCauley. Now he's in the middle, it's back to Hall. Foul by Whittle on Hall. The free kick to Argyle. 15 minutes to go. Dell takes the kick. That's it! What a goal! Oh, what a goal by Phil Rafferty! His bows with the free kick. Something like 10 minutes to go. Saxton, oh, that must be a foul, surely, but the referee, Eric Reid, has allowed it to go. That's the murder. Oh, yeah. Corner of a palace taken in injury time by Whittle. It's Alan Rogers who comes away. Five against three. This could be three-one. Randall across to the far side. Twindlehurst is back. Time was almost up. Would Allison be eating his fedora? This is Alan Whittle coming away. Oh, it's a penalty! The last kick. Surely Venables would rescue Big Mel. Penalty! Oh! My God! You know, it was one, one of those uh, happy times that, that you remember. And I remember afterwards in the, um, in, in the players' bar afterwards, um, because you used to always have the FA Cup draw after the match. And I remember listening and um, as it worked out, I was actually drawn um, but, well, the team were drawing against uh, Blackpool, my old club, so, so it was even better. Boxing Day provided a festive 4-3 cracker against Swindon. That pushed Argyle into the promotion places for the first time. They had risen an amazing 14 places in 10 weeks. Bargain season tickets were only £9, paying for a coach that cost... And we know that travelling, the distances that we have to travel, and I think we probably travel further than anyone else in this country, with, with the possible exception of Workington, I can't think of anyone else, mm. then we think it's necessary, essential, that we do travel in the best possible way. It's not a question of pampering for the players, 
and you know, I've been keen to point this out, we're not pampering to them, uh, we're trying to prepare them in the most professional manner. So it's a lot of money, but we feel justified, it's the speculation to uh, accumulate, isn't it? One of my most vivid memories of that season is going to Hereford and watching Argyle completely turn them over. Marin and Rafferty scored three goals between them, I think Billy got two of them and Marin got one, I think it was 5-1. That is always the, the true, sure, um, you know, true test of a, of a team's character, um, the, their away performances, because I think your, your performances, if you're going to get promotion, you need to get results away from home as well. It was the only time in, in all of my career that I think, um, with any other club, I, I can never remember scoring five goals or seven goals away from home. Back on home turf, fans were up for the cup. Is Macaulay. Highcastle going through, Rafferty on the far post, and that's not a bad one. Oh! <laughs> Throw into Blackpool, taken on the far side. Davis gets his head to it. Washes it out, it's more, but he couldn't get a shot in. Now he can. It's over the top. So the first corner of the game, taken by Paul Johnson, Bell back, oh! Well he nearly scored like that against Swindon on Boxing Day. McCauley to Hardcastle, Lenda Burrows. Well now McCauley has got Johnson on the far side. Johnson was in problems there, he had Delve offside, he had to put it back. Ball right across to McCauley. Mariner's on the far post and Johnson's in the middle. This is Rafferty, he's only got one man to beat and he tries to shot. Ball with Johnson. He's had two men on him throughout, but that's a good, good uh, cross indeed. That's over the top by Hardcastle. To Rafferty again. Oh dear! Brian Johnson with the corner. It's not a bad one. Dell flicks back. Rafferty! Oh, yes! Well, Dell was superb. He scored a goal like that against Swindon on Boxing Day. He flicked it back. And Rafferty was there to coolly put it in against his old team. 2-0, Argyle lead. 15 minutes into the second half. Ainsco, the substitute Tong, all tackled by Burrows, who's been very sound in the Argyle defence today. And with Rafferty, Delve in the middle, Manor up front, the Corley down one wing, and a hobbling Johnson coming down the other. But it's brought away by big Paul Hart. But like most of Blackpool's attack this afternoon, it came to absolutely nothing. Three minutes of injury time now, that one is back to Burroughs to try the shot. Burroughs didn't take it cleanly. And that's it, that's the end of the game. And Argyle are through to the fourth round. And they've beaten by two goals to nil, a side that previously this season had only conceded ten goals away from home in 13 games. And how often does Billy see that cheeky second goal? Um, well, every day, every day, because I actually have a, somebody did a, a super big picture of me um, scoring that goal, and we've actually got it on my um, staircase as, as we go upstairs. So, so I, I'm reminded of it every day. Against Everton. Or <laughs> Not every day you get a plum draw though. 
another ex-Argyle manager was to pay a cup visit, Billy Bingham and his high-flying Everton. The ticket queues were already forming. Coming for the nod back. Got more height than distance. Vassallo. McCauley. Rafferty. Did well. Johnson trying to get it, but Dobson does. Clements. Good running by Dobson. Goalkeeper's off his line and does well and then loses it and Pearson scores. Tragedy for Jim Pennell. He came out to give Dobson nothing to shoot at. But the ball went away from him and Jim Pearson scores for Everton. But Dobson making a good run, helped by his left half, Clements. And Pearson seizing on the goalkeeper's arrow. On by Lyons. This is Telfa. Got Pearson to help. Still Telfa. Now Lyons. Number two. And again the control break. Telfa doing most of the spade work. He had Pearson to his right, he had Lyons to his left. And he gave it to Lyons and Argyle were two down. Ten days after the cup exit and another legendary game. Another bumper crowd was guaranteed, helped by a Saturday win at Watford. Victory would put Argyle top for the first time. Free kick taken by Johnson. What a head crowd is still. Oh, cross wide. By Green. Offside. Rafferty. Must have a crack. He's got Johnson out to help him. That's a good ball from Rafferty. Good work indeed. Right across the goal mark. Johnson puts it in. Mariners there. He's kind of burrows. He may try a shot first time. And he does. Offside, but the referee lets it go. This is Argyle buzzing now. This is Joe. Into the middle. Oh, a good effort. Taken by Jones. That was Argyle working well. Well, the Argyle taken by Burroughs, 15 minutes gone in the second half. It's long, but nice time to green. Oh! And on the other side, taken by McCauley. Doesn't quite come to Johnson, Randall. To Burroughs. Argyle, the roar is deafening. Taken by Delve. 
the hole and has a shot. Oh, that was well planned. The call is. Cleared upfield. Green needs to win that ball. And he does. Comes back to Randall. Puts the cross into the middle. Johnson player. And this could come to Rafferty. It could be number two. He tries a shot. That's there. Oh, yes. time oh that's 2-1 but it's all over and Argyle are top of division 3 in fact Blackburn got ample revenge 10 days later with a bizarre 5-2 win at Ewood Park but next at home park it was Charlton also vying for promotion Mariner and Rafferty were by now one of football's top double acts. They led the goal-scoring charts and everybody appreciated their duets and solo performances. The two of them, the partnership is the best. I mean, in my 26 years at Argyle, I haven't seen a better partnership of two strikers than those two. I think they were absolutely superb and the crowd loved them. One thing I remember about then, and I stood in the den for them then, and used to chant and cheer with everybody else, and uh, was actually the chant for Rafferty. King Billy 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 Rafferty. I can't remember too much from Mariner to be honest. I mean, I tell you, wrap my brains and I say, well, didn't we chant for Mariner? I mean, we loved Mariner. I would say Paul was more forceful. Uh, he had that little edge with him. He had that extra bit of strength and power. I can remember him through his chest out and his head up and good headers. And Rafferty was the chap who would score the goals. A bit like when we had time and later on, you know, he thought, ah, Rafferty's going to score here. He just seemed such a classy player, didn't he? And he, um, he was one of those predators, but at the same time, he was a predator who had real ability, real class. He wasn't um, simply a sort of six-yard box goal hanger. Nothing wrong with those, by the way. But he wasn't one of those. He, you know, was great in the air, had a wonderful left foot, as I recall. But the key thing, surely, about those boys was that they complemented each other perfectly. They really worked together very well as a team with um, Mariner battering defences and Rafferty sort of sneaking in and just slotting a lot of the goals in. You always had that feeling that no matter what the other team were going to do, that Argo were always capable of scoring one goal more. You could be sort of up against it, and, but you knew you had it. You were always in with a shout. And um, you used to say strikers come in pairs and they were great. They were a great pair. They, they were a real handful. They were both quite big, uh, very mobile. Bill had a, you know, he had a terrific body on him, and he was strong. He would climb. He was brave, uh, and and Paul was, you know, at times a different class. He had a few tricks up his sleeve for getting, you know, he used to roll himself, get him, drop his shoulder and, and away. And he's a very strong, very strong player. And and so was Bill. I know the clubs, you know, been crying out for years for somebody who's going to score over twenty goals. Well, we had two there who scored twenty goals. In fact, Billy hit the post with a late penalty that would have beaten Charlton, but nothing could take the shine off that brilliant strike partnership. There's times in your career when you play with very, very good players that you have an understanding with and you have a mutual respect for. When that happens, uh, any young players that are watching this tape, you've got to grab it with both hands because it's rare. With strikers, it's not very often that um, you, you just feel so compatible with, with someone and uh, Paul and I, we, I mean, we, we were just great together. I mean, apart from uh, having a good understanding on the pitch, we, we both worked very hard uh, for each other. We just hit it off on the training ground, we hit it off off the field, we hit it off on the field, we, we knew each other's runs, the team knew what we were going to do, we in turn knew what the team was going to do and that was down to the coach down to Alan Brown, down to Tony about, you know, dr drilling it into us about pattern. In a lot of ways we were very, very similar players. 
Um, even on the pitch, people from a distance would uh, mistake us, you know, for, for one another. And uh, you, you would think with two people being so alike, it wouldn't really be a good match. But uh, it was, you know, I mean, as I say, I've never felt as comfortable on a football pitch with anyone. I just know that in the times that I played with Bill, I just uh, cherished him. You see what he went on to achieve in his career, he had a fantastic career and um, played at the very top level. He played for England in the World Cup. Um, you know, I have a lot of uh, happy memories of our time together. Billy and Paul were surely the star attractions for a rare match of the day visit to the lower division. Just Sutton. Jones. Evans. And again Sutton, number eight. Arvin Griffiths. Showing it to Delve and then taking it past him. Came back to Griffiths who might well get it. Oh, what a superb goal. A little bit of luck, but how much he deserved it. Arvin Griffiths, very much the original article. He took that ball past John Delve. Perhaps a little bit of fortune in the way it bounced back to him. Whittle also getting a touch. But he finished it off beautifully. McCauley. Rafferty in the middle, so too is Johnson. Davis to the left, and so is Thomas, number 10. And again, Wrexham have got six players forward. Oh, Davis! And the faces of Green and Vernell tell the story. So indeed is the face of Jeff Davis, his fourth goal in three games, and it could be the one that settles this match. The defensive error was there for all to see, and Davis cashed in. Foul, but Tinian has the advantage. Good refereeing again. Four in the middle this time. Whittle! And the Plymouth defence absolutely torn apart. So... I don't know whether it was a case of people freezing because... Um, they were on match of the day or whether they were trying too hard but we had just one of those days where just nothing went right we, we gave away some silly goals you know and we ended up getting beaten 3-0 and um, I think everybody was devastated because um, at that time you know it, it was quite an unusual thing for a third division game to be shown on match of the day and um, I, I think we were all hoping to show everybody in the country how good we were. But four days later, the lights were back on. Any, any night game in front of a decent crowd was absolutely brilliant. I was always one to have a, have a kip in the afternoon. Um, we usually trained in the morning and I used to like get me a den for a couple of hours, wake up grumpy and the grumpy you are and the, and the tired you felt, invariably you had a better game. But. Um, yeah, and especially if it was, if it was wet, it was, I always liked it a little bit to uh, take a decent stud, um, so other people could slow down a bit. Over the throw, Dell back to Hall. That's a good ball. That's a That's the one I'll go wanted. Mahan with a throw, it's a long one. That's Burrows upfield, well cleared. It's just narrow enough, but the referee's played advantage and it could be number two. Oh, clearly! Randall with a throw, finds for Corley. Back to Randall, got Delve in the middle. He puts it further up from that, Charlton's out of defending. That's not a good clearance. Styles is underneath it, so Styles, who gets up very well. Green out to Hall. That could be a very good ball for Mariner. Trying to wrap it in. Oh dear. That's a goal kick. Mariner. 
Lawson pressed it back. Could be dangerous. Still. That's it. Oh, that was an offense. Handball. The third corner in the second half. Johnson takes it. Oh! Oh, dear. Well, it hit the far post. And Bell couldn't turn it back. Oh, it's cleared. Bill is Charlton. Oh, just over the top. Preston doing a lot of pushing. This could come to Charlton. Oh, dear. That's it. The goal scored by Charlton. Four minutes from the end. And that's 1-1. One, one. one minute of ordinary time. Burrows takes the free kick. Comes across. A little flick. Yes! That's right. Lancashire Lab Pool had bagged a brace and the promotion bandwagon was back on the road. A 2-1 win. And if they were ever out of the promotion race after Saturday, they're now well and truly back in. A very tense game indeed. And Argyle won it. 2-1. No concealing the disappointment on that famous face. Free kick by Pollockin. Green heads it clear. And again, to Mariner. This is a chance. Rafferty is there. And Rafferty's got it. He's got one man to beat. And he tries a shot, but well saved by John Forrest. Through ball from the Salo. Hollican brings it away, but that's an error. Now the ball with Mariner. They have a shot. And he does. Oh, just wide. That looks like a goal. Oh, dear. Terrible errors in the Argyle defence. And Spence, Derek Spence is allowed through. And that's 1-0 to Berry. 13 minutes gone. Free kick taken by Saxton. Bill plays the dummy. Masalo out to Mariner. This is McCauley. Right down to the line. Oh, well saved by Forrest. Free kick taken by Green. It's coming to Mariner. Must be a goal. Yes! <laughs> one one. And Mariner had all the time in the world. He ghosted through, gave it to Rafferty. And that's one one. 24 minutes gone. To Saxton, to Rafferty. Mariner, Asalo, going to try a shot, and he does, right at the keeper. Brian Johnson with the corner. He comes straight to Rafferty, comes, oh, Green misses out. Well, he doesn't often go wrong from a position like that. Kind of Asalo, tries a shot. Kind of Asalo again. That's a very good ball indeed. Oh, what a peach. To Johnson, to Mariner. Headed clear by Hall. Billy Rudd puts it back in. Spence is there. Finds Williams. Gets the ball in the middle. That's a dangerous one. Spence and Rollins are there. It's still not clear. That's a good. No! Just wide by Billy Rudd. It looks a very good shot indeed. A terrible mix up in the Algar defence. Brian Johnson got the winner, Argyle stayed in second spot, and a local sage thought that's where they'd remain. Would you uh, like to suggest where Argyle might finish this year? One, two or three? I think they'll be uh, two, you know, I think they deserve to be number one, but uh, I think uh, my prophecy is they'll finish two. And so to the last lap for a squad that had been through a lot together. Not just in games, but in never-ending training sessions and practice drills. Now, unsung heroes and stars, veterans and youngsters needed just one more win with four games to go. That would clinch promotion.
and all of the hard work would pay off. It was one of the nights in Argyll history, Colchester, 1975. Burrows, Rafferty, if he can get inside, try the shot! Oh, and what a shot! What a shot from Rafferty, and what a brilliant save from Walker! Another corner to Argyle, taken by McCauley. Darrell has it back in. Pushed out by Walker, who is playing brilliantly. Johnny Hall to take the throw. Two and it's gone in the second half. Rafferty gets ahead to it. It comes to Mariner. He's pushed off the ball. No one can get a shot. And he's got Rafferty over on the right. He may try a first-time shot. He does. But Mickey Walker, once again, is in the way. Must have a shot. Shot's up! One nil. Five minutes of the second half gone. Champions, there's a chance. Johnson takes the corner. It's another corner. Coming up to four minutes, this is it. I ran on the pitch at the end with everybody else when we clinched promotion and um, you do things like that. You, when you sit in the grandstand there, you look down and you think, yeah, I can understand why people wanted to run on at that, you know, because they're so excited and they've achieved a, a goal, if you like, not a goal to score a goal, but a goal of getting promotion and that sort of thing. So you, you remember all those little things that come back and you chat and you're heroes. They're the same age as you, but they're your heroes. I hear this cliche, oh, it was a dream come true. Well, you know, you think about what you would like to do in football as, as a supporter of Plymouth Argyle. You'd like to play for the team. Where would you like to play? You'd like to play up front. You'd like to be scoring goals, right? Because you get all the plaudits and all the headlines. Well, that happened to me. And then what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to play consistently. I'd like to score a lot of goals and I'd like to be remembered as a somewhat of a hero. And I'd like to score the winning goal that gets us up into the next division. Well, just put yourself in that mindset. And it happened to me, and that I achieved it. Now, I achieved it because of the coaching staff. I achieved it because of the players, all the different units in the in the the team, the back four unit with Jim, the midfield unit along with the back four unit, and then Billy and I up top. You know, so so Billy and I working together, the midfield and Billy and I working together, the whole unit working together, and all the training that, that goes into that. That is the season. It amazes me that people uh, still think about you and still talk about it. You know, I think people have always talked over the years about Marin and Rafferty and it. And it's lovely to think that uh, they've still got that affection for you and um, it, was, it, it was a great time. Full house, end of the season, you know, just a, a crescendo of, of excitement. And I got a lovely feeling when, when, I, when I go back into Plymouth and it's amazing that even now that um, if I'm walking along the street in Plymouth, people will come up and talk to me and, and recognise me still. So, so I can't have changed too much. <laughs> Bit less hair. <laughs> I still get letters from uh, supporters from all over the place, man. You know, not just down the southwest, from all over the shop. It was, you know, the, the green and white stripes that we play, they played in. And there's a, I think there's a shot uh, when I... I think the supporters were carrying me on their shoulders, or maybe the players, I can't remember who, but I just see, I, I was on people's shoulders, people send me that shot and kind of sign it, and then 
it was just, I mean, to score the goal that takes you up is, is in the crowd coming on the field and, you know, the whole nine yards afterwards, it was, it, you know, that's what you, you do all your training. I mean, the blood and the sweat and the climbing up telegraph poles with Alan Brown and doing 17 mile runs with Tony Waiters, it pays off. And uh, that's why you play, you know, for those moments. The family that I live with, the family at the club, the backroom staff, the people that made the tea, the board people, you know, it was it was a great family. And uh, that is, is the biggest secret to the success of the club. 27 years on since I've been gone, I still get letters, I still get emails from people from Plymouth or supporting Plymouth that either A want to know what I thought of something or B, uh, please will you sign something. And that's great. That's uh, in my dotage when I'm, I'm 50 now and you know I'm talking to me, to me kids about it who still live down in the southwest. Nice. It's a nice warm thing. Argyle's vintage side finished second and were the division's top scorers. Like the strikers, Fennell and Green played in all 46 league games. But it will always be known as the Mariner and Rafferty season. Their names were everywhere. It's funny, you know, a friend of mine at that time, um, his wife bought a couple of kit kittens, excuse me, kittens, and um, they were named very, very quickly Mariner and Rafferty. And that combination of Mariner and Rafferty lasted about 18 years. Now I think if the real Mariner Rafferty combination had lasted 18 years, God knows where we could have gone. <laughs>